Should pale death, where trouble dread, make the ocean caves our bed, God who hears the surges roll, deign to save the supplement soul. The Lighthouse, inspired by many sailors' myths and lore within the seafaring landscape in the 19th century, presents a hauntingly claustrophobic setting. The decision to film in grey tones heightens the claustrophobia within its visual aesthetics. With the constant reminder of the lighthouse, it blares its existence within the noise, or lack thereof, throughout the film. Two men on an island in the murky distance, with many shots cleverly merging the sea and sky to emphasise the main importance evolving around their job, their lifestyle, even their lives, with a lighthouse. The struggles become a reality when their ride back does not turn up, with both men eventually questioning the quickening presence of time, and how much of that was used for work, and how much was slipping away as they question their true selves and reveal true identities, causing a domination of male ego, all within the giant phallus that is the lighthouse. This is two takes, and this is one shot, an analysis of the film The Lighthouse. This film was chosen by James for this review, as a thank you for his donation to the podcast. If you wish for a film to be considered, email the show with your suggestions. Spoilers are throughout. From an interview with Robert Eggers, the director of this film and The Witch, he played with classical mythology, two stories in particular that wouldn't usually be merged together. Using it as a playful undertone for the story between both men, Prometheus and Proteus, display a story that collide within the realm of man. Let's start by explaining their connection. Prometheus was a trickster titan in Greek mythology that stole fire from Zeus to give to the humans as a gift, as well as help them use it and help them in their metalwork. This angered Zeus to the point of punishing the titan to eternal torment by bounding him to a rock with an eagle, known as the Emblem of Zeus, sent to eat his liver. His liver would grow back overnight, only to be eaten again the next day in an ongoing cycle. What is interesting is the choice of the liver, which, in ancient Greece, was often thought to be the seat of human emotions. Pair that with the meaning of Prometheus to possibly mean afterthought, the young Thomas Howard, known for the most of the film as aimed from Winslow, is the personification of this myth by his drive to steal the light that holds knowledge, much like fire did for mankind, from the older Thomas that he is forbidden to see. But why is the light of a lighthouse presented with this much importance? Kieran Fisher from Film School Rejects explains that the light is a universal symbol of illumination, spirituality, wisdom and intelligence. And so, younger Thomas fell because he learned all about the secrets of the universe and light itself, and couldn't take it. It was the type of knowledge that the gods don't want lesser beings to understand. The other myth was about Proteus, an early prophetic sea god who serves Poseidon. Described as the old man of the sea by Homer, to others they call him the god of the lucid sea change. Like the constant changing nature of the sea, Proteus can tell the future, but based on various stories, he will change his shape to avoid doing so, answering only to those who capture him. If we connect this to Thomas Wake, the older lighthouse keeper, it emphasises this absolute refusal to share the knowledge that is presented in the light that he obsessively keeps to himself. Other aspects throughout the film, such as having the uncannily accurate prediction of Howard's young Thomas's death, the sudden changes in his appearance with tentacles and sea coral, or more predominantly, his change in his behaviour to the point of questioning whether Wake, old Thomas, is gaslighting his second in command, merge this mythological god of the sea into human form. There are many ways someone can change themselves to adapt themselves to the situation to which they can gain control. The indication of capture from the stories of Proteus might explain the scene where Howard gains control over Wake by walking him on a leash and making him lie in a hole full of water whilst he's being buried alive. Wake hints about the light again, and Howard dives down to retrieve the keys to the lighthouse that are constantly on Wake's belt. It might go back to the domination and control based on this story, that the only way to get the knowledge is through the capture of Proteus, and in the film this is done through domination. More lore can be found by the repeated and angered message of it's bad luck to kill a seabird, to which Howard does by beating one to death. It is said that seagulls are possessed by the souls of dead sailors. 
If someone kills or harms one, they will experience their own misfortune later on. The final scene of Howard naked on the rocks, being eaten by seagulls, can be interpreted as the spirits punishing the young lighthouse keeper for disrespecting them. Other theories have merged that one particular seagull is actually warning Howard before he befalls the same fate. However, he is seen as a nuisance. It can be pointed out that this seagull has only one eye, and through dialogue when Wake explains about his last second in command, and how he has only one eye and went mad and died, it can be a connection to this particular seagull being Wake's lighthouse keeper mate, his spirit hindering or helping the younger lighthouse keeper. Knowing Robert Eggers, there is more that meets the eye, quite literally. There is always hidden aspects within the film, with the confusing madness and paranoia between characters in a bleak landscape. Eggers commented on how the audience needs to pay attention to one-eyed things, and how they can manifest with symbolism and meaning. We have one, the one-eyed seagull, the most obvious, but let's go deeper. There is the image of the head of the assistant with one eye missing found in the crab crate by Howard. Yes sir is corrected by I sir. The mermaid's right eye is seen wide-eyed. Wake smacks Howard at the beginning of the film, giving him a black eye for mocking the seabird law. This could present the idea that the two eyes could represent two people on watch, with Wake represented by the left, leaving his mark on Howard by striking him. But then Wake is killed, leading to the final scene, back to Howard on the rocks having his guts eaten by seagulls. His right eye has been plucked, perhaps indicating that there is no one left on watch. Well, what is the reason for all this talk about eyes? If we go deeper, there might be bigger theories brewing, so bear with me on this as I try to explain. Thinking about the whole aspect of the lighthouse, in a mythological sense, the island that both Howard and Wake travel to for the fog, for their four-week slog as lighthouse keepers, seems to introduce itself almost as if it's a living and breathing thing from the depths of our underworld. I say an underworld because the boat itself could represent Hade's psychopomp, guide to the souls of the dead, to which his responsibility was to gather the shades of the dead, souls, from the upper world and lead them down to the shores, ready for Charon, the ferryman. The intention of the eyes is because in order to cross over, payment is made for money being placed in the eyes of the deceased. If there is no payment, the soul must stay on the shore, stuck, for a hundred years. It is almost as if Wake and Howard, supposedly given the duties of lighthouse keepers, are stuck between the world of the living and the world of the dead. This might be because payment was not fulfilled in full, indicating back to how it's always one eye, not both, that are plucked or seen missing, and the lighthouse perhaps being the pinnacle of showing the way of being in the middle. Purgatory, until further notice. Everything else, along with madness and paranoia that ensues through Howard's unreliable eyes, leads the audience to not know what is true and what isn't. But don't fret, they even lie to each other. While well, the alcoholism and a masculine dominance that now and again slips into angry vulnerability, it's from the moment their boat does not pick them up, the concept of time and place, or what is true or false, falls to the wayside. Their past comes back up in conversation now and again, however, this outside conversation becomes internal, only about them, like they are the last two people alive in the world. They butt heads like angry goats, with conversations that lead to arguments, accusations and violence from the destruction of their bodies, or eventually drinking kerosene, to the destruction of their house, from a storm, they unravel whilst they wait the purgatory out, realising, through drunken truths, that both have horrible secrets and have been lying to each other, and most importantly, to themselves. Their lies? Howard reluctantly confesses letting Ephraim Winslow die, however, an interpretation of visuals within the story say that Howard killed him, to which Howard stole his identity I wanted to start anew. Wake, harder to decipher, as you must remember that everything we, the audience, see is from Howard's point of view, thus making him an unreliable source, has lied about his life, and perhaps even about his first mate, the one that went mad, the one with the head in the crab basket. Wake might have killed him. So we have two murderers in a lighthouse, alone for four weeks. Wake's lying and manipulation of his unheard warnings and presenting a front of being one with the sea emphasises the irony of being buried in the dirt. The burial scene in itself personifies how one cannot bury one's past. How his confession gives rise and reason to his punishment of dying like Prometheus, with Wake's echoing question, Why'd you spill your beans, Tommy? 
threading the empty house and long hallway up to the lighthouse. Almost as if living in ignorance might have been a better path, much like Wake keeping Howard away from the light. Reddit user Dr. Nature96 explains Howard's intention for wanting to see the light. I think Howard imagined the lantern to be more than just a lantern. He wanted to know what Wake was keeping from him that made Wake guard it so preciously and jealously. Howard has allegedly figured out Wake's lies except knowing what was hidden in the lantern. However, I think he found nothing there. What I think he found may sound too simple, but I think the depth of the story is not found in the lantern but the perceptions surrounding it. I think whatever he touched in the lantern simply burned his hand, in the literal sense, but he didn't let go and thus physically hurt himself because he was fixated on the idea that there was something more, and thus emotionally and psychologically hurt himself. I make assumptions. He wasn't looking for wages, he was definitely on the run and looking for atonement. I heard someone point out that Wake mentioned that keepers before thought they would find salvation in a lantern. Maybe Howard was hoping for this and found a real lantern instead of a genie lamp. Going back to the bureau scene, of how it presents the idea of how one cannot bury one's past, it also emphasises this and with past traumas and failures. If one would ignore them, bury them, kill them and steal the keys to salvation, or the keys to the lighthouse in this sense, by force, then one will only see a false light at the end of the tunnel and get devoured by one's own fears, much like Howard with all his troubles and unsure reasoning behind everything he does. The lantern light has many interpretations, and Howard's reaction leaves the whole experience open-ended by its importance or lack thereof. However, I am in agreement with Dr. Nature 96. It wasn't about the literal lantern slash light. It was what it could have done if possessed. Howard wanted the peace of mind that Wake was in possession of, that end result of enlightenment, of understanding oneself and not make the same mistakes again. This could lead onto another theory of both men, with the same first names, being the same person repeating the same mistakes again and again. The story of one man raging at himself and his own mistakes, like an older version of oneself wanting the younger to do different. Big things, such as both being murderers, being liars, leads onto smaller things, such as Howard's eventual belief in something supernatural, whilst Wake believes in it wholeheartedly, and how, if looked closely enough, how Howard breaks his leg on his fall down the stairs, falling down a spiral staircase, making it a never-ending cycle, connecting him to Wake's missing leg in the film. Howard, young Thomas, though being eaten on the rocks in the last scene, does not show the audience how the cycle repeats itself, sure, but one can imagine. Pagatari has no sense of time, with memory blurring like the background between the sky and the sea. There is no definite ending, or even a beginning, just the middling ground of the story. Although the title is The Lighthouse, it is a metaphor for something more human and unobtainable, of atonement and realisation. The introduction of the lighthouse itself is revealed slowly but surely within the fog, blaring its attention before you can even see it. And then in the last scene, when the mistake is formulated again, with no one learning anything or changing, the lighthouse disappears, leaving the trapped souls of the sailors with Howard, entertaining the notion that the lighthouse might not have been there in the first place. If you enjoyed what was said, please follow me on Anchor, Spotify and other podcasting platforms for the latest episode. And be kept in the loop through my Instagram at two takes underscore podcast. If you want to help me in the making of each episode, there is a listener support platform that can benefit the levelling up of this podcast, as well as have you, the supporter, having access to extra content. Find this at anchor.fm slash two takes podcast slash support. And as always, thanks for listening.